try and do every day is I try and build businesses. And um, the theme around entrepreneurship, particularly in so far as it relates to black South Africans, um, for me is a conversation that 21 years into democracy, we should be contextualizing it. If we had an hour, we should contextualize it for five minutes and spend the other 55 minutes talking about solutions, frankly. Uh, maybe I sound like some of those people who like to brush things under the carpet. Forgive me if I do. But I'm 37 years old. My eldest child is eight years old. My youngest is four. I don't have time on my hands. I need to create a country that they can live and succeed and um, achieve all of the objectives. So I apologize up front if I'm, if I'm not going to take too much time belaboring the problem. But let's go back to some context. For me, everything starts unbanning of the ANC. The country's rulers at the time are under pressure from a movement and a very coordinated um, structures, whether banned or unbanned, whether in country or outside of the country, that are putting pressure on an oppressive government to change. The world has also moved on. The years of colonization have gone. Of course, before then, slavery has gone. But the world is also moving to a time where self-determination, democratic values, and the likes are starting to become the talk of the town. And the oppressive apartheid government of the Nationalist Party is starting to lose ground globally. And yes, to a large extent, economically, they could live in a closed world. But now the world is trading with the rest of the world and lives are moving on. So there's a lot of pressure in the late 70s, as, well, maybe early 70s, earlier on, for them to start thinking about reform. And it's really the work, I would say, of the many freedom fighters, politicians, clergymen, everybody who put their lives on the line and some lost their lives to pressurize the government to have to change. If you are uh, interested in the history of South Africa, which I, I, I'm amazed at how many people don't know about it. There's a very interesting book um, that's written by a gentleman by the name of um, Christy van der Vestesen. I think he's a, he's a journalist for, for the Star. And it's called, about, it's, called about the, it's, it's called The Rise and Fall of the, Nas of the Nas Nationalist Party. It's fascinating about trying to put into context where we come from. What that context meant was that South Africa, as you probably know, was one of the last countries, if not the last, to gain that kind of freedom. Many of our African brothers and sisters have gained this freedom on the basis of war. So there was tons and tons of bloodshed. But there's a good thing about war. The good thing about war is that the winner takes all. The good thing about war is that there's no negotiation. There's no settlement. I take what I take because I'm the victor. Slight problem with South Africa, which is the context of the conversation today is that we didn't quite have that. Yes, we had a lot of people lose their lives. I read a statistic not so long ago about the lives lost between 1985 and 1989 being the highest amount of lives that were lost than any other period in the history of the country. We all know about the state of emergency. We're all probably uh, we're still waking up now to see what's really happening in the world at that age. I know I certainly was. I was born in 1978. So 1985, 86, 87, 88, I remember it. I was awake and I could see what was going on. We ended up in a period that, as you all know, started just before the mid, uh, just before, just after 1990, rather, of what I like to call a negotiated settlement. You're all business people. If, uh, if not yet, you are at least business students. And you know that the one thing about negotiations is that nobody gets everything that they want. Nobody gets everything that they want. So by definition, everybody had to make concessions. The African government made concessions. The ANC-led negotiators had to make some concessions. Perhaps we were so in love with the idea of voting Perhaps we're so much in need of basic services because we essentially lived like slaves in our own country. Perhaps that was such a requirement at the time that we had to make certain concessions. And the one concession we made, ladies and gentlemen, is the economy and how it would then start having the majority of the population, being African black particularly, participate in it. We didn't lock that one. You know, in uh, legal agreements, which I'm pretty sure Lindani also sees way too many of them, there's this thing called CPs, 
conditions precedent. In other words, the deal doesn't happen if these conditions are not met. Then there are these things that lawyers like, which are called best endeavors. You know those ones. Best endeavors are saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to try our best to do this thing. But actually, the deal happens, and there's no need for this thing to be done. But we're going to give it our best endeavors. We probably got a best endeavors clause as far as the economy is concerned. And here we are, 21 years on, belaboring the point that there are not enough black entrepreneurs, belaboring the point that unemployment has risen again, once again amongst the youth, more so than ever. And we somehow find a way to delineate that from where all this started. I now have had the pleasure of working for Deloitte, for Investec, and for myself. And I can guarantee you, as a commercial person, I too, if I was part of the nationalist government, I would have tried to get that out of you, black South Africans. Because in a commercial environment, nobody gives something up because they are a nice person. In a commercial environment, you take as much as it is that you can take, and you only concede what it is you're prepared to concede in relation to that which you got. So off we went. We got equal rights. Off we went. I lived in Durban. I was brought up in Umlazi. So the only thing we ever did that was free and cheap was go to the beach. And I remember the first time we went to the white beach. It was an occasion. Okay, there were lifeguards who didn't know what to do with us because there were so many of us all swimming at the same time. There were these loos. They were so clean. They had all toilet paper. They had toilet paper the whole time. They had toilet paper, which is not something you obviously had in the black, in the black beach. And of course, you know, the toilet paper ran out the first day we were all there. The point I'm making is, there are all these things that we got. And for 21 years, I really think, I really think that we as a country, perhaps a few learned people, but we as a country didn't quite register the extent of the concession. That just how much we had given up. So at least us who have the benefit of higher education, let's all not sit here and pretend as if this is something we all woke up to. This is a consequence of a negotiated settlement that we signed 21 years ago, or 24 years ago. That's it. So now that we are here, what to do? I would submit that it's, uh, it starts with a concerted effort from two big role players. And of these two, I think one of them has really tried. It's the public sector and the private sector. So it's our government, to the extent that they are policy makers, to the extent that they are a big part of the economy, to the extent that they are a big part of infrastructure, big procurer, big employer, big part of the economy. And it's the private sector, big part of the economy, control the key sectors, you name it, banking, you name it, broadcasting, you name it, financial services, you name it, they're there. Manufacturers, automobiles, construction, Government doesn't play in all those sectors. It's controlled by the private sector. And these two worlds that converge day to day in this thing we call the economy have a role to play to try and redress the consequence of the concession of 24 years, 25 years ago. In my personal opinion, I think the government is tried. So the five things I think that you should know that nobody bothered to tell you in this thing called entrepreneurship. And you know, they don't tell you because they say they love you. The parable that I like to use, sir, is marriage. Um, this year I'm married for 11 years. And I remember telling my uncle that I'm about to get married, and this is the girl, and this is what they need to go and do to the family. Three years into the marriage, because you then quickly realize that when we were dating, it's nothing like when we live together every day. So I called one of my uncles outside. I'm like, hey, man, how come... You didn't warn me about these things, you know? How come you didn't tell me that half the woman of my dreams is now my wife? She can be a bit of a pain in the butt. And he told me it's because you love me. And I think some things happen around entrepreneurship where you don't get told certain things because people really want you to prosper. Principle number one is yes, whilst the government is trying to create the environment, don't get into this thing if you don't understand that failure is part, of the, is part of the journey. It's just going to happen. 
what all you can try to do is one minimize the impact and two learn from them because they will happen now just like you will fail you will also succeed what i mean by that is you can live a dormant life you know you can avoid all sorts of things happening to you you can avoid dying from a car accident if you sit at home every day okay but that also means you're never going to have a balanced lifestyle because you'll never get the outdoors but by putting yourself out there you may very well be run over by the bus business is no different just like you're going to fail you're also going to succeed because failing means you're trying it means you're out there and you're trying to push at whatever it is that you're trying to do which then puts you in in line of failure but it also puts you in line of success a good idea not always a good business idea how many entrepreneurs have you met lindani who say but lindani i got a good idea it's really good again it's part of that love talk just like my uncle never told me about marital problems nobody tells our young entrepreneurs that your idea may be a, a good idea it doesn't mean that it's a commercially viable proposition and that's what you need to run a business you need an addressable market you need some level of scalability at some point you need a customer you need to solve a problem with consistency all those key requirements and you can add more and more depending on how many books you read are the things that you need to run a proper business not a good idea and no better example i have of this than apps you know apps on your phone there are hundreds of millions i'm not kidding not thousands millions of these things the reason why you only have a finite number on your phone is because those are the ones that you thought are willing to one either pay for or to use for free right the other hundreds of millions never made it here they were just a good idea so hey what it would be really cool if we had that doesn't mean it's a good idea and people spend a lot of time putting their whole savings putting their jobs to pursue an idea that they never once asked is it a good business idea a tip for me is you must be able to solve a problem in a sustainable way now all right we'll give up Ma many people are not for this thing guys and you need to be comfortable with that fact this may not be for you this does not mean you're a bad person this just means you're a smart person you are you are self aware you've done maybe some research on what it will take and it's not for you one of the key reasons why many entrepreneurs fail i think is that inability to be close with self and be able to assess for themselves whether they'll be able to live the life of lindani making revenue of 200 million but still can't get the bank loan first you need to get to the 200 million before you even have that problem even at 200 million she has that problem that may not be you you may really be after a, a very secure future maybe you feel you can make the most impact in a corporate environment which we need leaders particularly black in as well so this is not doesn't have to be for everybody and this other line that's all about entrepreneurship you want to have a great life start a business no in fact if you want to have guaranteed income keep a job i'd say so maybe it's not for you my favorite entrepreneurs wannabe entrepreneurs are always working on a proposal a uh, refine retuning their business plan and uh, really hypothesizing sitting behind the desk working on models no one's selling no one you 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 meet friends for drinks and you tell them about your awesomeness you're not spending time talking to customers you're not pitching how you can retain the clients you have and get new ones if you're not selling you're not in business forget it if you don't like sales if you don't like talking to people if you feel uncomfortable if you feel like oh my god they're gonna think i'm poor and i really need them yes you are poor and you really need them if you're not prepared to be that exposed to clients in a way of course that they still want to deal with you right you don't want to come out way too strongly but this is i know it sounds basic it amazes me how many so-called entrepreneurs that complain about opportunities out there aren't selling if my week ends 
and having been in front of a brand new person who can buy one ad on power, it's been a waste of a week. Because what am I doing managing producers and news editors and radio shows? That's what I employ the other people to do. I need to be selling. So when I'm at Regenesis trying to sell you a spot, you must know I'm the entrepreneur I'm talking about. But if I'm sitting in my office waiting for Regenesis to pick up a call and say, we'd like to have a slot on power, <sighs> then I'm not the entrepreneur. And way too many people who say they want to be entrepreneurs don't want to sell. They don't want to sell. They even tell me they'll employ people. I don't get it. You are the entrepreneur. You want to hire someone to go and convince people to spend money with you. We that a blue man. You haven't even made the money, but you've already planned. I've heard it before. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hire this guy. He works for multi-choice. He's really, really good. I'm going to pay him about 20 grand. The rest will be commission. Have you thought that when this guy goes in front of a customer, he has no way of articulating the vision? He has no way of articulating why you even exist. Clients buy energy. Clients buy passion. Clients go, I'll give this guy a chance because there's something from him or her that I'm getting. I want to be part of this thing. I mean, in our business, there's not even a better example, I would say. We're two years into the game. We pick on 106,000 listeners. Our number one competitor is 702, 33 years old, 800,000 listeners. I have no chance of convincing an advertiser why they should give me their money on that score alone. And I'm going to hire someone other than me and given to go and sell? Because the client is just going to say, ah, 100,000. 800,000. Two years. 33 years. Same what you say. John Roby. Whatever. The world is against you here because you're a startup. So if you're calling yourself an entrepreneur and you're not going to go in there and take 702's money because essentially that money was meant for them, this is not for you. It's not for you. And, and lastly, um, from being an entrepreneur and not being a portfolio investor. Diversification way too soon is dangerous. Your capacity is limited. You're a human being, okay? You hopefully have another life beyond your business. So there's other people that need your, your time. If not loved one and children, at least parents and friends. You only have 24 hours in a day. Nobody gets 25, although I sometimes wish I had 25. I sometimes wish that everybody else had 24, and, I, and God just gave me an extra hour. You know, like, uh, who was it in the Bible who was able to tell the sun to stop? Joshua, right? I wish I could be King Joshua and tell the sun to stop. The rest of you guys do nothing. I get to catch up on all the things that I'm behind on. But nobody gets that. No one's King Joshua, right? Everyone is stuck with the 24 days. If you are trying to sleep some of those, at least five or six hours if you're lucky, you can calculate how much time you have. When you over at diversify and you're involved in way too many things and your capacity is still restricted, you're running a risk of not being able to finish off anything you start. So this idea, when BE started, that all of us should be investors in various industries and you had all these big conglomerates, BE conglomerates, they were everywhere, we included. The money we lost was in a call center. What the hell was given and undid it doing in call centers? What are we doing? It's because we believe that you need to work. It's nonsense. Be protective of your time and your energies and even your investment. Rather, what you should do is intensify. What I mean by that is within the core skill, there will be ancillary services that you can provide. Look at the story of Segula Kwabi. Didn't go for the traditional model of starting out as an audit firm to do external audits. They cleaned up their own space in the market. First, it was internal audit. That's what we all knew SKX to be about. Suddenly, they're winning work for all sorts of things out there. That, for me, is the intensification. It's to be even stronger in my space. We'll try and play them much later. Uh, Steve Jobs um, and um, what's Mr. Microsoft's name? Bill Gates were on stage together. They were clearly still younger. And this gentleman got up from the platform and they were having a Q&A and he asked a very simple question, which I thought was profound. And he said, what is the one thing that we could 
adopt or learn that could help us to achieve even half a percentage of what the two of you guys have achieved. Steve Jobs answered him, and all he spoke about for about a minute was passion. And he talked about how hard it is to start anything, and why is it that you would need passion to get you over. I couldn't agree with him more. And my own view of passion and its relationship to building a business is that if you follow that passion, whatever it is that is your passion, it helps you with many of the things I've spoken about. It helps you with focus and intensify as opposed to diversify. It helps you with selling because whatever you're selling, you're passionate about. And in my view, the rest will follow. Thank you, sir. I'm done. Thank you, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen.